Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the last time we did this, I had the pleasure of telling you that SOFAB was about to open its library. And now I get to tell you that it has been done. And so the SOFAB Culinary Library and Archive is open. Not all 12,000 volumes are on the shelves yet, but we do have many thousand on the shelves and they're continuing to being shelved being shelved, and we are also fortunate enough to have um, people who are now calling us saying, I have a thousand books, I live in a mobile, can you come and get them? Or I have, we have one person in Mobile who was a food editor in the 1940s who has collected pamphlets from that time that were sent to her as food editor of the paper, and she still has all of them. She said she counted them. There were like 1,300 pamphlets from that time. So those are being donated to the museum, I mean, to the, to the library. So we're really, really excited. And I'm just happy to share that with you. So today, we are fortunate enough to have with us Ms. Kit Wool. And she is a real culinary uh, establishment in New Orleans. She has for many, many years been in public relations and marketing and has known some of the greats who no longer are as well as some of the greats who still, who still are cooking for us today. Uh, and also she is a fabulous author and she has written many, many cookbooks and many, many series and we're gonna talk about those so I'm not gonna go into that too much. But join me in welcoming Ms. Kip Wolf. So, Kit, let me ask you, um, how did you get started? How did you decide that this is something that you wanted to do? Is this something you studied in school or was cooking? It, no, not cooking, but becoming a person and in, in going into food at all. How did you uh, decide to, to do that? My mother couldn't cook. I was hungry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so did you cook for your whole family? Or I did. I wound up doing that. But the very first thing I ever cooked was from the Girl Scout cookbook, and it was egg salad. And mm -hmm. I, I just the aha moment was a miracle. Mm -hmm. I said, it's in a book. I have the things. I can make food. <laughs> so you learned to follow the instructions. Yes. And so when did you learn that you could, you could um, manipulate that a little bit and add your own creativity? It, it took a while. I was well into my teens because my sisters and brothers uh, weren't very excited about spicy food or strange food. Mm -hmm. So, uh, How many I'm, brothers and sisters? I'm the oldest of six. Oh, wow. So you had quite a few to, to cook for. Yes. My poor husband, when we first married, I'd, I'd just stand there and peel 20 pounds of potatoes <laughs> without thinking. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so where did that lead you? I wound up somehow in advertising, marketing, and public relations, and focused on the hospitality industry, mm -hmm. by and large, the entertainment and the hospitality industry. So I worked with a number of hotels and restaurants. So you started, but didn't you start out to be an artist? How did you? Well, my background scholastically was art, mm -hmm. but you can get very hungry doing that. And at that point, I decided eating was more important than <laughs> Painting. Uh -huh. You could always paint on the side. I could always paint on the side uh -huh. and still do. Yeah, I want to ask you about that later. But so, so go ahead and tell us. You got involved in, in, in the marketing with the hospitality industry and in entertainment. Yes. Uh, I started working with Warner Brothers, uh -huh. and we toured a number of the uh, movie stars all over the South. Uh -huh. uh, Used to go to wonderful meetings in Los Angeles, oh, see funny. all the stars and the glitter and the fun. Mm -hmm. And the reality is it was a lot, of, a lot, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But that led me into public relations mm -hmm. and hotels and restaurants. Mm -hmm. So. And so what was your favorite hotel when you were first starting out? At the time, they were all my favorite. Okay. They were all <laughs> favorites, like children. You mm -hmm. love the one you're with. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I think the most fun I had was the Royal Sinesta Hotel, mm -hmm. because at the time Archie Kasbarian 
was the general manager. Mm -hmm. And he later bought Arno's restaurant. Mm -hmm. And so my husband and I started doing the marketing there mm -hmm. as he opened it, as mm -hmm. he refurbished that grand old lady mm -hmm. and opened the, the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was quite an experience all the way around. And the, the history of it was, was remarkable. And finding all the places that Germain Wells had tucked things. And at one point, we were crawling under her bed to get boxes of memorabilia out. Oh, wow. And so, is he? Did uh, Archie create the um, the museum, or Archie created the museum for Mrs. Wells? Mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, it was open and done and beautifully done. Uh, shortly before she died. And so he had a she gala Mardi Gras ball for her. Uh -huh. And that was quite, quite, quite the evening. Oh, yeah, I'll bet she, it was. she taught him how to escort a queen around the ballroom. I can see that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was spectacular. Oh, wow. Yeah. And did you help work on the menu? We, what? we worked All every, everywhere, everything. Uh -huh. Anything he wanted, uh -huh. he was that kind of he was that kind of guy. Chefs loved him. Every everyone who worked for Archie loved him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Loved him dearly. He was a man before his time. So tell us a little bit about Warren Lewis. Now Warren was again one of the giants. Mm -hmm. He I met him with Al Copeland mm -hmm. because he was doing some. Uh, research and test cooking and things for Al in the test kitchen. Mm -hmm. And Al ran chronically late. He was never on time. So you'd go for a meeting and of course it wasn't going to happen for quite a while. So I learned to go to the test kitchen where they had food and wait up there. Mm -hmm. And Gary Darling, who mm -hmm. owns uh, Zia now mm -hmm. with two of his partners, was the corporate chef. Mm -hmm. So Gary and Warren would be up measuring things out by the gram, by the grain. And whenever you provide food in a system like Popeye's to go to that many restaurants, it has to be totally the same mm -hmm. in every single restaurant. So their task was to, A, satisfy Al's taste buds, which were not easy to satisfy mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. and then to make sure it was so stable and so consistent that it would be the same red beans and rice that you got in any one of three or 4,000 restaurants. And so was it originally done in the big commissary and shipped out, or it was made at each of the restaurants? I'm not sure exactly what process happens in the production of it mm -hmm. uh, after it leaves the test kitchen. Okay. I never got to the plants. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I enjoyed the test kitchen where they used to have a lot of food. And so, um, did you did you know um, uh, Warren and get involved with the um, Chef Charity for Children? I knew Warren in those days, yes, mm -hmm. and did did some things and helped him. I knew him well when he had La Ruth's, mm -hmm. which is a terrific restaurant. Yes. Loved it dearly, mm -hmm. and we actually did some ads for him uh, when he opened Chelsea's uh, Custard. Custard. Mm -hmm. Custard. We did an ad that had uh, the Mississippi, the point was, it was on the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. So we had the Mississippi River, but the, the, the stanchions were ice cream cones. <laughs> <laughs> it weren't like that. So he, he, he's a great man. Mm -hmm. He was a great, great man. Mm -hmm. In fact, I spoke with his son not long ago. And he, he only produced two small books, booklets. He, he said cookbooks were too much trouble. He'd rather cook. Well, what do you think about that? I think he was right. <laughs> <laughs> Except you produced them anyway. Yeah. No, no, but he was a much better cook than I am. <laughs> but he was a genius. He was a food chemist. So when he dialed it in, it stayed dialed in. Yeah, I remember eating there. It was just absolutely fabulous. Well, I introduced him to uh, Archie Kasbarian mm -hmm. after uh, Archie had owned the restaurant for a while and was trying to make sure that the remoulade sauce that they're so famous for mm -hmm. was always the same. Mm -hmm. Again, that's the big challenge with any product. Mm -hmm. So 
Warren came down for lunch and met Archie, and they got along like a house of fire. Mm -hmm. they, they adored each other. And so Warren worked on the, the remoulade sauce and made sure it was dialed in properly. But we sat there one day at lunch, and he gave me a two-hour dissertation on the hamburger. And everything that goes into making the proper hamburger and the ratio of bread to meat, and in the meat is meat to fat, and condiments to meat and bread. I mean, he, 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 he was right there with it. Yeah, he was a scientist in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. That's really I'm just I'm just sad he never did a big cookbook. I have maybe I have twenty four or forty eight of his recipes. Mm -hmm. And they're all gems. You know, you you they're treasures. Yeah, they really he was wonderful, I agree. Yeah, it was great. So did you um we you sort of talked about uh, Al Copeland. So tell us, how did you get started working with Al Copeland? How did that begin? <laughs> oh, golly. Al, God, we loved Al so much. He had, uh, I guess, half a dozen stores. Okay, was, he, was the chicken suit still part of things at that time? The oh. chicken suit? Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Lamar Berry running down Decatur Street. Uh -huh. To La Boucherie. Was it, no, it was Charters uh -huh. in the chicken suit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lamar. <laughs> I told. Tights, yellow tights in uh -huh. the chicken suit. Yes, but that was, that was back then. They only had half a dozen stores, and Lamar needed some help, so brought us in. Mm -hmm. We had an agency at that time, and uh, we did a little of this and a little of that, and then Al started opening stores, and so we'd send out telegrams when a store would open mm -hmm. in, you know, East Coast and Pinocchio. And that was how, how communication was at the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We'd send telegrams to the newspapers and the radio stations. It was just a hoot. And then, of course, the, 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 the company grew and grew and grew. Mm -hmm. And then what we did for them grew and grew and grew. Mm -hmm. So you developed their whole ad campaign? You... Lamar did the ad campaigns. Okay. Billy and I did more of the promotion and publicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and handled the media, mm -hmm. as in media relations, not, not advertising. We did some advertising, but that, that was not really our focus. That was Lamar's, Barry's focus. And so were you there along the way as Popeyes added new products? And oh, new... yes. Okay. Yes, everyone in the company, everyone having anything to do with Popeyes gained 25 pounds when they were testing biscuits. <laughs> you could not walk into the building without somebody handing you a tray of hot biscuits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what, what was the whole process of, of, uh, that Al Copeland had when he decided, OK, we've got to do this, so we have to add that? Is Katie bar the door. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Drop everything and go. OK. So, so um, when they decided to do red beans and rice, for example, how did that happen? And how, what, how long was the process of testing? Oh, I'm sure it was forever. He, he didn't put anything out that wasn't ready. He, he introduced the biscuits twice. He let the biscuits roll out and then decided they weren't, still weren't what he wanted. Pulled them back and then maybe six months or a year later, he they, came they out came with the biscuit again. Mm -hmm. again. I, I don't really know how long red beans took, but I'm sure it was considerable. Mm -hmm. And Warren worked on those. Right. So would he try it first and sort of say, OK, um, this is kind of the direction I want to go in? Or did he just kind of say to Warren, you come up with a good recipe and let me no, taste it? No, he'd say, I think they ought, it ought to be this, this, and this. Uh -huh. And then he would. When it was time for our meeting, he'd come up to the test kitchen and he'd taste what was happening. And he'd say, this is good, but it needs more of that. Uh -huh. And I, I'd do less of that and more of this. And mm -hmm. Warren called Warren and, and uh, Gary called it splitting the atom. <laughs> so, but it was that precise, and it was almost daily. You know, it was on and on and on and on. And I truly think that was the secret to Al's success. He truly never gave up. Mm -hmm. He never said uncle. And so what about going to Nuggets, deciding to have spicy and mild? What about all of those kinds of things? Well, initially when he started his chicken mm -hmm. store, he'd had a donut stand. Mm -hmm. And down the street was a fried chicken, a Kentucky fried chicken. And he was working 
24 hours a day, and they were closing at night and going home. And he thought, wow, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's pretty appealing. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he started working with fried chicken recipes and did that for quite some time, a couple of years, mm -hmm. experimenting, and initially asked a bunch of Jefferson Parish politicians to sit down and taste his chicken, which they did, mm -hmm. and they said the spicy was too spicy. So mm -hmm. Al came out with the a mild. mild, and the name of that chicken restaurant was Chicken on the Run. Mm -hmm. It was so fast you got your chicken before you got your change. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it was not a happening thing. It, the, the mild chicken wasn't going over very well. Uh -huh. And so Al decided he had to switch to the spicy chicken. Uh -huh. And had gone to the movies that night, and the sign painter was waiting to, what name am I going to put on this? Uh -huh. uh, Al had been standing on the street corner handing out flyers for chicken on the run and mm -hmm. trying to drum up business, but he decided a name change was in order. So he went to see the French Connection. Mm -hmm. And he knew the sign painter was just desperate. Mm -hmm. And Al loved to deadline people. Uh -huh. so, uh, so he had to deadline himself on this one. Oh yeah, and so he was there watching the movie and Popeye Doyle burst into the room and said, up against the wall, Popeye's here. And I got up out of his seat and went into the lobby and called the sign painter and said, name it Popeyes. <laughs> so this was before he got permission or anything? Oh, permission. <laughs> <laughs> Why in the world would you get permission? <laughs> so was that ever an issue? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. It became an issue uh -huh. with success. Y yeah. And so by that time, um, he just could turn it over to lawyers. At that point, say, yeah. it, it was... Yeah. Do it right. Yeah. Take yeah. care of it. Do it right. He was a hoot. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, he, he really had the idea of bringing this all over the country. And, and in my opinion, I think he was really, really essential in bringing a sort of taste of New Orleans to the whole country. Oh, I agree with you. Completely. Because I don't think that flavor profile that he has in his chicken, which if certainly not reproduced any place else, was ever something people had even imagined. They hadn't thought of it. When, mm -hmm. when we, we went up for the opening of the Washington DC restaurant, mm -hmm. when it opened, and the people there were stunned. I mean, mm -hmm. there were lines. Mm -hmm. And just like there had been in New Orleans, mm -hmm. when, when the new restaurant would pop up in the neighborhood. And, yeah. And yeah. everyone was scattered out. And then he's brought red beans and rice everywhere? Red beans and rice. Well, <laughs> we had to call it, uh, I think, Louisiana rice or Cajun rice. Oh, because probably, because dirty out, rice out, sounds... Yeah, dirty rice, what yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah. I think it was Cajun rice. But, uh, but the, those flavors and those dishes were something, and all of the crawfish and shrimp and everything that he's got everywhere. I think that's... seminal. Yeah. I've, I've always credited him with doing that. So Paul Prudhomme, of course, was very important on a, on a different plane of making people aware of Creole and Cajun food. But I think that actually bringing it to people was something well, it's different. that It's Al a different Copa price did. point. Sure, that's and, true. And too. actually, in, uh, Paul was lighting bonfires in restaurants across America, mm -hmm. just as Al was really rolling out with Popeyes mm -hmm. and Copeland's. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it was all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. It truly was. Mm -hmm. uh, and what Popeyes allowed was a lower price, a lower. Uh, you could you could enjoy Cajun food for less money than mm -hmm. in a uh, in a fine restaurant. dining restaurant. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and I, I accuse restaurants across America of maligning, blackening, blackened mm -hmm. redfish. You know they. Don't do it right. Yeah, I don't think they do either. Oh, Greg Reggio will give you a session on that. Okay. He, he came over to my house one day and showed me exactly how to do it. Exactly the right way to do it. Yeah. And, and he knows, you know, with Z, and he worked with Warren. Right. Uh, mm. And with Al. Mm -hmm. So when those guys get together and get particular about a recipe, they're not kidding. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. 
But that's, I, I think that that's fascinating. And I also believe that Al Copeland just doesn't get the credit um, for that really important ambassadorship that he had about food. I'm not sure. I've always thought he was marvelous, that, that he has, he, he was a big guy. Mm -hmm. he, he did a lot that people aren't even aware of, mm -hmm. um, and aside from food. Mm -hmm. you know, he was a, a world champion offshore powerboat racer, mm -hmm. of all things, uh -huh. and uh, did tremendous charitable acts that he would not allow us to publicize. Mm -hmm. and he was very private about that. He said, okay, I need you to go do this. I need you to get Christmas presents organized for 5,000 children. And they each have to have three presents. They have to have a big present, a little present, and a stocking. Mm -hmm. And I said, how am I going to do that? And he said, figure it out. Figure it, but that's how, and they have to be delivered by a Santa on Christmas Eve. And he said, we can't have a party. <laughs> right. Let them come to us. He yeah. said, no, no, Santa doesn't do that. Santa comes to your door. You might have to have several Santas. He said, okay. <laughs> so the next thing we knew, we were, we were conducting a Santa school. Uh -huh. But we went to the Archdiocese, and all the churches sent us the names, each parish, the names of children that would benefit from this. Mm -hmm. And then a number of their gentlemen volunteered to be Santas. Mm -hmm. And then we took a whole floor at corporate headquarters and set up wrapping stations and Santa gifts. It looked like a toy warehouse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Al had to approve every single toy. And mm -hmm. again, deadline, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, at the last minute, that's mm -hmm. not nice enough. That's a cheesy football. Get a real football. So he, mm -hmm. he got really serious about it. And then... Uh, I know my husband will, will remember this well, but the, the first Santa night, mm -hmm. Christmas Eve, it was cold. I, it, it was one of those Christmases where we were, it was just bitter, bitter cold. And Al insisted on going on the first Santa run. So we met at the rectory. Mm -hmm. The priest, the priest wanted to see it too, because he, yeah. he, he, he didn't believe any of this uh -huh. was really going to happen. So we meet, Santa's there, the toys are there, we're freezing to death. We go to the house, and Al and, and Billy and I are standing on the corner, kind of hiding, because you know Santa doesn't have an entourage. Right, right. So he's with an elf, uh -huh. and the elf had a camera, a Polaroid <laughs> camera, so he could take a picture of the, the children and give one to the parents, and then take a picture for Al. Uh -huh. So we had the elf also. Anyway, so the doorbell rings, and the kids see Santa and the elf and the sack of toys, and they had to be net and labeled, uh -huh. you know, for little Susie and little George. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The first kids opened the door, and the three of us stood on the corner and just cried like babies. Mm -hmm. You have never, it, everything that led up to it, all the work, all the employees at Popeyes, it took all of them to organize it and shop for each kid and wrap everything. Everything that led up to it was nothing compared to seeing the amazement on those little kids' oh, face. I'll bet, yeah. It was, oh, it was fabulous. That sounds wonderful, yeah. But we never did talk about that. Uh-huh, yeah, those aren't things people know, you're right. But again, Al understood it. He understood that little kids love Christmas lights. They love Christmas. They love Santa Claus. And if he could do it, he was happy to. Well, and he must have loved Christmas, too. Oh, he loved Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Oh. OK, I want to shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about your books. And uh, we'll, we may go back and talk about Marty's and some of the other oh, restaurants God, yes. and everything. But tell us, I want to make sure we talk about your books a little bit. Well, I have to thank Archie Kasbarian because shortly before Katrina, mm -hmm. I think we date many things from that. I think so. Uh, he had asked and suggested that uh, I do an Arnaud's cookbook, which we worked on for quite a while. Mm -hmm. We had all the photography and we had the recipes and we worked together with everyone there at the restaurant and got it put together. And it came out just a few weeks before Katrina hit. 
Well, that was kind of a letdown, of uh -huh. course, but the book did very well for its launch. And after Katrina, I was thinking what to do because our clients were all underwater. Uh -huh. You know, they were shut, our restaurants were shut down. Sure. Our hotels were shut down. Right. So what to do, what to do? And so my husband and I talked about it. I said, well, why don't we do some more books? That one was so much fun. Uh -huh. And so I went to see Pelican Publishing. Uh -huh and uh, suggested this series, mm -hmm. gave them a little sample of it, and they said, sure, go ahead and do it. And we haven't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad habit. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great series. You can have one book, or you can have all of them. I, I, I'd like you to have them all. Of course. <laughs> Well, we have them at the library, too. Oh, good. Yeah, so uh, I know we, um, we're making sure that we cover those. And, of course, we used to sell them also in the gift shop. At the yes, I remember museum. that. So, uh, yeah. So along the way with the, the mm -hmm. little classic books, I call mm -hmm. them small books because they're only 96 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, the P&J Oyster people mm -hmm. asked us to write their cookbook, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. Mm -hmm. We had a grand time with that, and that's a large book. Uh -huh. It's the same size as the Arnaud's book. Right. And then we, I had an idea for the James Beard Foundation, because mm -hmm. so many of our chefs have wonderful awards, and they go to the ceremonies, and it's grand, and then it hangs on the wall, Right. the ribbon. Uh -huh. why, yeah. why isn't there a book? Uh -huh. And so. I visited with the James Beard people and suggested it, and they said, sure, go ahead. Uh -huh. And a publisher picked it up, and there we there are, off to the races yeah. again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think I, the, the books are they're just wonderful. The photography is great. Thank you. And you do those yourself, yes. right? Do you have a little studio? Or? Uh, much to my husband's dismay, I do. And so how, bi how big is it? Is it just a little area, or is it like your whole, a whole room? Well, I took to what it. had been my workshop, uh -huh. basically a studio, mm -hmm. and gutted it and ripped out a wall and put it in a greenhouse roof and made it a lot larger. <laughs> but that's so that you have natural light coming in? We have in? natural light. Uh -huh. We have a shooting table. And sometimes, you know, we have a, a it's on wheels. so. Based on the light, mm -hmm. we can roll it all over the house uh -huh. based on the time of day. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then we have all sorts of photography tricks we do too. And so do you do the styling yourself? Yes. So you do it all. Yes, but that's only because in New Orleans with all the restaurants we've worked with, mm -hmm. there were never really any food stylists around. Mm -hmm. And because of the agency work, I was always on the other side of the camera mm -hmm. saying, make that apple look red or turn uh -huh. it to the left. I never touched a camera. Uh -huh. But Paul Rico, who's a fabulous food photographer, mm -hmm. uh, he just recently retired, uh, was the man I worked with the most, and he taught me a tremendous amount. So uh, thanks to Paul. And then every now and then when we're pushed, I bring in other photographers to work with me and keep, keep it going mm -hmm. at a steady clip. Well, one of the things I particularly like about your photographs is that they look like somebody who knows about food took the picture. Because even though they're, they're beautiful pictures, a lot of times photographers who aren't cooks or eat, even, even eaters, um, Shame on them. They will have, the picture will be beautiful, but they'll emphasize something only for the art of it as opposed to for the flavor or the evocation of what it will taste like. And, because they think it's a, a more aesthetically beautiful sort of photograph. And yours say, eat me. Yes, and, and that's, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what you want that picture to say, yeah. and, and you capture that. Thank you. Well, we have a great crew. We have uh, a series of young men who all are at Tulane mm -hmm. University, and they're in a fraternity. And every year, the fraternity sends me a different young man. To be like your intern? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. To be my assistant. We give them money and we give them food. Uh -huh. And they do everything. Uh -huh. you know, they help set up for photography. They learn to style food. And most importantly, they're my food testers because they have a recipe. They're fledgling cooks, if at all. They can make ramen noodles uh -huh. and, and maybe a peanut butter sandwich. Uh -huh. and if, but if they can read a recipe 
and then do the mezzan plus, uh -huh. which we teach them how to do, uh -huh. and have all their ingredients lined up, uh -huh. and then assemble the recipe, reading what we've written, and then execute it properly and eat it, and it hits the, f the proper flavor profiles, we have a winner. Right. I, I don't want you to cook the recipe because you know how to cook, uh -huh. and you're going to bring a little bit of that to the party. Uh -huh. We, we prefer somebody who doesn't really know how to cook. No, I think that's a, that's a smart idea. Yeah. Yeah. And these, these kids are wonderful. Uh -huh. And they use computers, and they water the plants. They do light construction. Uh-huh. <laughs> do everything, you're right. But th to be the tester of the actual food as well as a tester of the recipe, that's really good. Yes. Yeah, when, we, when we were doing the, the, the P&J oyster cookbook, uh -huh. in fact, our young man that worked on that book is now a chef in California wow. in Napa Valley uh -huh. at a at a Michelin star restaurant. He's very proud we're very proud of Zach. Uh -huh. But we would have sacks of oysters and we would cook oysters, oysters, oysters. And when we finished the book, uh, P and J gave the boys another great big sack of oysters and a great big oyster party. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, so do you do testing <coughs> just in your own kitchen? Yeah, but I have a pretty industrial kitchen, uh -huh. pretty commercial set but, kitchen. But they have to also be able to cook it in the kinds of pots and pans that people would have at their homes. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, no, we don't use any restaurant. See, it's a misnomer, it's a fallacy to think that chefs withhold ingredients mm -hmm. and secrets. That's not so. Mm -hmm. What a chef is cooking in a restaurant and he's preparing food for what? Hundreds. Hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. So their recipes are scaled to that proportion mm -hmm. and that, that the kinds of techniques that, that provide that kind of food. Right. So when they give us a recipe, we either scale it down or they've rewritten it for us. Mm -hmm. And it's a different recipe. But at the end of the day, it should be the same result. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's no secret to it. There's no trick to it. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say for New Orleans chefs, mm -hmm. in fact, all the chefs we've worked with, uh, they're the most generous, generous, giving people in the world. I've only had one chef in all these years refuse to give me a recipe. Oh, wow. And, and I thought, well, hmm, I won't eat in your restaurant. Right. <laughs> I won't put your recipe in my book. So, right. And I didn't. <laughs> but, well, if he uh, wouldn't give it to you, you couldn't do it. That's right. Oh, I could have faked it. <laughs> yeah, but it would no. be hard to attribute it to him if you had Truly, faked it. Truly, I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. But no, chefs are the most generous people, and they love to feed people. That's what they get their jollies doing. That's mm -hmm. why they're chefs. Mm -hmm. They're giving. Mm -hmm. So, Well, so when you were writing the James Beard book, did you, you took chefs from around the country. Actually, it was the James Beard, we got lucky. It was, the James, it was going to be the James Beard Foundation's 25th <coughs> anniversary. Uh -huh. And we hadn't realized that, but it turned out that was the case. Uh -huh. And every year the foundation names one chef over all the chefs, all the regions, uh -huh. as chef of the year. Uh -huh. And as a result, each chapter of the book focuses on the chef of the year. For, that, for the for 25 that year, years. For 25 years. Mm -hmm. So it was a different chef each year. Mm -hmm. And we had the really difficult work of traveling around the country to interview these food gods uh -huh. <laughs> and goddesses uh -huh. and eat their food uh -huh. and get their recipes and photograph them and hang out in their test kitchens. Somebody it was just do difficult. Yes. Very, yes. very difficult. <laughs> You're so brave. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget Billy sitting in the, the chef's kitchen at La Bernadette, and little, little people were bringing him delicate morsels. Oh, to and keep his strength up. Yeah, to keep his strength up. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just, oh. <laughs> but uh, they're, by and large, every single those are the top chefs in America. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're genuinely. Uh, the very top of their game. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the most charming and delightful and accessible people you could ever want to, to meet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just fabulous. I mean, Judy Rogers at Zuni Cafe in San Francisco 
is a kick. And she showed up a little late because she'd had to stop at the hardware store and buy some brooms. <laughs> well, if it's your restaurant, you probably have to do everything. Yeah. And when, yeah. when we were in, in Thomas Keller's test kitchen at the French Laundry, we walked in and he kicked off his clogs and said, take off your shoes, we're working in our socks. <laughs> he put on Sting and away we went. That's great, yeah. And Michelle Richard in Washington. Mm -hmm. I mean, just remark and today, of course, we lost uh, Charlie, Charlie Trotter, Trotter. Yeah. who was a prince. And he'd visit here often and we'd go to uh, Willie Mays and have fried chicken. He, he would come and do the big charity events and they all do that. Uh -huh. The, because they're, they're giving back for their own good fortune. Mm -hmm. But on his own time, he, he wanted to eat where we ate. Well, going to Willie Mays is a good place oh, to eat yeah. fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so tell me about some of the other restaurants, like Marty's. And of course, that's reopening. I know it's not the same people. Oh, no, it's wonderful. I, mean, I think I, it's cool. Marty Chamber was, again, a giant. He, he had the first bistro-type restaurant here. Mm -hmm. He was breaking ground and only did it because that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He wasn't thinking of any great marketing scheme or mm -hmm. any big thoughts about anything except he thought the French Quarter needed a bistro where people could eat late and, and eat at the bar if they wanted to and mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And so he installed the cook from his hunting camp and left him wisely alone. Mm -hmm. and yeah, Chef people, put out great food. Right, and it was it was really wonderful. It just seemed so chic to be able to eat that late after you've oh. been to the theater or oh, whatever. Please. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite Marty stories. Uh, Marcel Bienvenu, who I'm sure you're well aware of, was doing a, a story about uh, Sazeracs. Mm -hmm. I think it was Sazeracs, and going all over town tasting them. And her last stop was Marty's. And she'd had a few Sazeracs. <laughs> so she walked into Marty's, sat down at the bar, ordered a Sazerac and a dozen oysters. And then she got up to walk across the restaurant for something. And when she came back, there was an older gentleman sitting at the bar eating her oysters and drinking her Sazerac. And she turned around to the waiter and said, that gentleman's eating my food. And he said, well, ma'am, that's Mr. Tennessee, and he gets what he wants. <laughs> oh, wow. It was Tennessee Williams. <laughs> so Marcel said, okay, bring me another. Bring me more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, that's really funny. And then Tom Cowman, of course, oh, and Jonathan yeah. down the street. That was also a groundbreaking restaurant, uh -huh. and he did tremendously original food. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole restaurant oh, was just Oh, glitter, glam, yeah. wow. Yeah. You know, I was, what, 30 and thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Yeah. <laughs> they had a grand piano. Yeah, and all those wonderful etched glass pieces. Etched glass and cocktails with, uh -huh. in glasses with stems. stems. <laughs> <laughs> Not a beer mug. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But then Tom went on, you know, they tore Rampart Street up and that really led to the demise of both Marty's and Jonathan, Jonathan. Mm -hmm. because the Performing Arts Center was uh, interfered with. The whole thing mm -hmm. fell apart for both of them. Mm -hmm. And Tom went to um, uh, the Upper Line, mm -hmm. and I was very happy to have him there. Yeah, yeah, and um, Rise Ochsner, didn't she do a She did a wonderful portrait, portrait, portrait of him, yeah. which is still there. Yes, yes. In fact, yeah. I borrowed it to scan it for, a photo, for one, of, one of my books. And it, it's a great, great photograph of him. And she's back in New Orleans. I know, I know. Yay. Yes. We had a, uh, an exhibit at the museum of many of her New Orleans portraits yes. of chefs. And so uh, we are really familiar with her work and, of course, with her also. Yeah, she really had a way of capturing oh, yeah. that feeling of being a chef. And, the sense of power over the kitchen, and yet that warmness. There, there, there's a lot of humility going on. Mm -hmm. And you know, I hadn't really thought so much about it, and Thomas Keller is the one that, that pointed it out to me. He said, you know, chefs and cooks used to be household help. Mm -hmm. It was a blue collar job. Yeah. And in France, and Europe, and America, everywhere. Mm -hmm. He says, it's only been the last few decades where 
chefs have become respected for being professionals. I mean, they were always professionals, but received the celebrity. Right. Well, Leah Chase talks about that. And she was not interested in having her children become members of the part of the business. And so, you know, Edgar has a PhD and all this oh, sort yes. of thing. You know, she has very, very educated children. And yet her grandson went to the Cordon Bleu. And so um, then he is in the business. And it's kind of skipped that generation. Well, Dick is a hoot. Yeah. He's very good. He's a great cook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, Leah is, is uh, my hero. I want to be just like Leah when I grow up. Uh -huh. I truly do. I think I think that's a great aspiration. I want to be I want to be her too. <laughs> yeah. She she told me the most wonderful story, and it goes back to how wonderful our chefs are, and how giving they are. But I'd stopped in there one day. It was before the restaurant had opened. It was a few few weeks before it opened after mm -hmm. Katrina, mm -hmm. and I had taken a photograph of her that she liked. Said. So had it blown up and framed. So I pulled up at the back door and went in, mm -hmm. and Leah's standing at the stove cooking, mm -hmm. making a big old pot of gumbo. I said, Leah, what are you doing? The restaurant's not open. And she said, well, Kit, I'm not supposed to tell anyone, but the president's going to come for dinner tonight. <laughs> I said, OK, how are you going to do that? And she said, well, when they called me yesterday and asked if the president could come to dinner. I said yes, and she said, and then I picked up the phone and I called Mr. Fulce. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mr. Fulce, I don't know what to do. The president's coming to dinner, and I don't have napkins and tablecloths, I don't have any wait staff, I don't have any provisions here in the restaurant, and I have no dishes. I don't know what to do. He said, Leah, give me your menu, and we'll be there. And sure enough, when I walked out of that restaurant, there were half a dozen John Foles trucks in the parking lot, and they were unloading to beat the band. Yeah, they certainly do help each other. Yeah, it was, it was, it was grand. Yeah, and I like to see them together anyway. Oh, yeah. They have a great friendship. Well, John yeah. Foles is, is, is a prince. I love yeah. the school mm -hmm. that he's doing. I love the school that Yuno's doing. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled at the work Delgado's done. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we're coming into our own as a culinary arts center for education. Well, I think, I think that, that's, uh, that that's really important because so many years we've had young chefs come here to do a stage in the great restaurants that we have, but we didn't have the culinary schools to match the level of restaurants that we do. So yes. it's really wonderful to see it come up there. I think yeah. we're here. Well, I'm hoping that Delgado, especially just because it's here, can get some of the equipment that it needs and things like that to be a little more cutting edge, you know. But other than that, I think I think we have great faculty and great students. I sent my nephew through through Delgado, mm -hmm. and he he did a, 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 a. I think it took him an extra year, but he was having a wonderful time in New Orleans. <laughs> uh, as well as cooking. Uh -huh. But he wound up cooking for Wolfgang Puck for seven years uh -huh. of servitude. <laughs> right. And then came back and cooked for Emerald for seven years, I think. Oh, so he, he, did yeah, he did very well. We loved yeah. having all those young men uh, to come for Thanksgiving and holidays. And help all, out. The, all the yeah. students. Uh -huh. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all the apprentices. You know who else went to Delgado is Ken Smith, since we were talking about Upper Line. Yes. He, uh, he went to Delgado and... Uh, so did Tommy Di Giovanni at our nose. Oh, okay. Tommy's a fabulous uh -huh, chef. Uh -huh. Well, I think about Ken because he gave his entire collection of books to the library. Whoa. And when he became a priest, and, or when he decided to go into the priesthood, he was giving away all of his worldly goods. And uh, that's what he did. We went to his house and packed up a thousand cookbooks, including all of his rare books, because he had a wonderful collection of uh, rare uh, cookbooks by African, early African-American writers. Oh, wonderful. And he gave those to us also. So he didn't hold back anything. I think he kept a couple back 
but that was for sentimental reasons, not because of monetary reasons. I don't think he sold anything. I've, I've have, I have some marvelous cookbooks and memorabilia from the research we were doing for the James Beard book oh, that know. go back quite a bit. In fact, I know where they can go. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I know where there's a home for them. So, oh, tell me a little bit about Schwegman's. We did their advertising. Oh, that was fun. I bet it was, yeah. And they were innovative too in the, in the grocery business. Totally, totally innovative. They were the first store that had their own brand. Mm -hmm. And also, they had the largest store in the United States for a while. Yeah, and did you know that John Swigman's baby picture was on the bread wrapper? No, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, goodness. And my husband was the dog food man there when he was a kid. And he was punished. <laughs> and that's where Al Copeland started. Really? I didn't that's know what that. Lit, that's what lit Al up. Oh, wow. He I didn't a, realize it was so connected. It is. This is a small town. I know, yeah. No, Al was working uh, after he dropped out of school mm -hmm. at the soda. You know, remember, when you went in, you could get a beer or a soda or, right, or whatever yeah. at, the, at, the, at the stand. Mm -hmm. And there was a little red-headed guy who was just hustling and working like crazy and almost doing backflips. You're just putting it here, putting it there, getting it there, getting it there. Uh -huh. And I said, why are you working so hard? And the little red-headed guy said, because I'm so much better than you are. I'm better than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and man, that, that lit Al up. <laughs> yeah, I bet it did, yeah. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> funny. That's funny. Well. I want to ask you if you have any sort of closing remarks for us, anything that we need to remember about you or your um, career, any advice for anybody. What do you think? Eat out often. <laughs> <laughs> Cook a lot. <laughs> Eat well. Yes. Eat well. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. You want to join me in thanking. Thank you. Thank you. Good